Well, it's good to, uh, to rejoin you. Though, let me begin by making a kind of apology. And the kind of apology is this. A card has been in circulation announcing the titles of these particular sessions. Uh, those were provisional titles, and possibly I was to blame for not having underlined that more strongly at the time when I communicated them some time ago to Kevin. Possibly it was a little bit of his fault too, but I'm too much of a gentleman even to hint at that possibility. It does, it does mean, I said possible, to modal. I mean, we've got to be very careful here. So I'm not actually going to speak on whatever it was you said in the card. Something about perseverance, is it? Uh, I'm going to take, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to take instead the Old Testament, as, uh, as Kevin said. It's interesting what you said about uh, Maltman there. Richard Bockham would be the main commentator on Maltman in the UK, I think. And nowhere is Richard Bockham sterner against Maltman. No, nowhere is he harsher in his language than in the volume, what is it, God Will Be All in All, I think, the one, is that it? Uh, he co-edited with Trevor Hart, didn't he? Where he takes Maltman to task for Maltman's casual slack use of the book of Revelation and his ind Maltman's indifference, as Bockham sees it, to the way in which scripture presents its own material. Now, I mustn't take up any more time because uh, we're starting a little late, and I do uh, enjoy, I did enjoy yesterday the discussion. I want time for discussion, so what I must try to do is to resist any asides as I go along. I don't like doing that, so if you allow me to stick to my script uh, best I can, I'll just crack on with it so that we have maximum time for discussion. We're moving on then to the Old Testament. Rudolf Bultmann famously observed that the history of Israel was a history of failure, an observation fated to bring on the charge of political incorrectness in the popular, though perhaps not in a literal sense. We may not be persuaded by Bultmann's reasons for arriving at this judgment. He held that Israel had been seduced into identifying God's eschatological activity with what happened in history. But in an important respect, he was right, and others who differ considerably from Bultmann and from each other, from H.H. H. Rowley to N.T. Wright, have provided similar formulations. The most detailed study known to me of election in the Old Testament, and Old Testament scholars correct me if I have this wrong, is that of Horst Dietrich Preuss, who built his whole Old Testament theology around that very theme, the theme of election writing when it looked as though the day of the classic Old Testament theology might be done. Preuss approved Gerstenberger's observation that, and I quote, the failure of the people of God is a theme of the Old Testament to the same extent that their election is. Note, a theme of the Old Testament. So not a judgment by the New Testament and not a judgment from outside Israel and the church. The Old Testament, or Hebrew Bible, is often castigated for its arrogant religious exclusiveness, which menaces a world otherwise bathed, it would appear, in Elysian tranquility and benign toleration. But do the scriptures of any other world religion tell a story so devastatingly against its own people, as does the Old Testament? You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth, therefore... I will punish you for all your sins, announces God through Amos. Israel's failure is chillingly sealed at the conclusion of 2 Kings 1718, towards the conclusion, when the Lord removed them, that is the people of Israel, from his presence into exile. In diachronous coordination that is all too precise, Judah eventually follows, forcing kings to conclude with a closing scene that is none too hopeful or edifying featuring Jehoiakim eating regularly at the table of evil Merodach in Babylon. Yet if we follow the order of the Christian Old Testament and not that of the Hebrew Bible, and so read the narrative on through to the books of Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah, we end on a different note. In fact, 2 Chronicles concludes as astonishingly as 2 Kings ends dismally. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you 
May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Now, I'm going to be uh, using the NIV translation when the exactness of translation doesn't really matter. In other words, when there's no controversial point at stake. At one stage, I will be raising a question about the translation, but I'll just use the NIV, even if it's not the best rendering up until that point. Behind Cyrus was the Lord himself, who moved his, Cyrus's heart, to make this proclamation throughout his realm and to put it into writing. In Ezra and Nehemiah, there is a resettlement of a Jewish community centered on Jerusalem, One whose prospects, as we come to the end of the narrative, are by no means hopeless, though Ezra's prayer in chapter 9 reveals him to be the perfect realist. The turn of events at the close of Chronicles, in its way, keeps Bultman's judgment intact. For the manner of the exile's return and the consequent possibility of rebuilding the temple actually highlights more than mitigates Israel's failure. It is Cyrus who is instrumental in God's hand. In case we have not fully grasped this point, it is repeated and even expanded at the beginning of Ezra. And for the benefit of us contemporaries whose main interest is in how any project is funded, Ezra also reports Cyrus's declaration that the costs of temple rebuilding are to be paid by the royal treasury. The bold thought might cross the reader's mind that Cyrus has momentarily assumed the Davidic Solomonic mantle. But a bolder word still was found on the lips of Isaiah. Cyrus is God's anointed, whose right hand God has taken hold of, a veritable Gentile Messiah, it would appear, although von Rad thought that this was to mistake the author's rousing rhetorical exaggeration. Anyway, salvation is apparently of the Gentiles. If we have followed the Old Testament narrative up to this point, or if you prefer, its assortment of narratives, What is most surprising in this turn of events is not the Gentiles have some interest in the temple and the salvation of God's people. It is their involvement in deliverance to the point of temple reconstruction. Presumably the tabernacle in the wilderness was built partly of materials provided by the Egyptians, I presume, willingly but unwittingly, when Israel fled Egypt. But it was the work of Israelite hands. With Solomon's temple, we have Solomon's initiative, but Hiram places Tyre on Hire, and it is built with Sidonian labor, too. So there is trans-ethnic collaboration. Now the temple is rebuilt by kind permission of Cyrus. Of course, informed that Nebuchadnezzar had seized the articles of the house of God, Cyrus doubtless harbored a prudent anxiety to see them restored. But that does not matter. What matters at this point is the work of God, not the motives of men. And in that respect, Cyrus is part of a wider picture. According to that wider picture, the nations are destined to be beneficiaries of Israel's election. The call of Abraham is in the interests of the nations. Descended from Shem, Abraham was the idolatrous child of God's covenant with Noah, a covenant of extreme breadth taking in all the earth relaunching a story that started with the creation of Adam and ended in grief and flood, substituting emphatic blessing for precisely equally emphatic cursing when the Abram story comes in correspondence to the earlier chapter of earlier chapters of Genesis. Very shortly after his introduction in the narrative, Abraham builds an altar, as Noah had done, and calls upon the name of the Lord, as people did around the time of Enosh, Adam's grandson by Seth. Abraham will mediate a unique blessing to the nations. God's direct, unmediated blessing abounds as it is. Canaan, son of Ham, is destined to be slave to Japheth as well as to Shem. For Japheth is blessed not only with the extension of territory, but also with habitation of the tents of Shem. In fact, Joel Kaminsky, in his recent study of election from a Hebrew Bible perspective, proposes proposes that we speak of the elect the anti-elect, and the non-elect, placing Japheth in the last category. The distinction seems to me to be a fair one as long as the categories are not interpreted as static constants in the Old Testament and a given nation assigned with equal constancy to one class rather than another. If we avoid that, there is something in the distinction, and Kaminsky is not guilty of of rigid stratification. Ishmael 
is circumcised and blessed along with Isaac. There is Abraham, as Esau later joined Jacob, burying Isaac. And indeed, uh, Ishmael retrospectively looks as though he headed up a shadow Israel before Jacob took Leah and Rachel. For Ishmael fathers 12 sons, who are described as 12 tribal princes, rulers, leaders. Ishmael, it has been remarked, this is Kaminsky again, by the way, has more markings of election than perhaps any other non-elect person in the whole Hebrew Bible. But compared to that blessing which Abraham will mediate, we have seen nothing yet. When Moses summarizes for the people of Israel its own history, purpose, and destiny, he charges it to carefully observe the Lord's decrees when it enters the land. Quote, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Centuries on, we feel the weight of these words. The visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon is actually, it seems to me, closer to the peak of the Old Testament narrative than we might immediately suppose. For she is not only bowled over by the external splendor of the court of the king, but she responds thus, Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. The elect is less object for the envy of the non-elect than the occasion of praise to him who elects. We hear Hiram utter praise in terms stronger still. Got references for these in front of me. Our account of the Queen of Sheba lies in narrative proximity to the high point of Old Testament narrative. Solomon's building and dedication of the temple. The books of Kings and Chronicles provide parallel descriptions of this. It is in connection with the temple that we learn what it is that elect Israel has to give to the nations. The Queen of Sheba is not introduced to us as a second-class citizen whose dark-skinned beauty should pale if such a thing is possible. And if she had beauty, which I've always assumed, why, I don't know. She's not introduced as the one whose second class and whose beauty should pale in comparison with the temple of the Lord God. She's not given the crumbs of wisdom and understanding while the food is reserved for Israel. The connection between the dedication of the temple and the arrival of the queen is actually made verbally clear in Kings, where it is not in Chronicles, if you compare the passages. Kings mentions, as Chronicles does not, that the queen had heard of Solomon's reputation in connection with his allegiance to the Lord God. But in both accounts, Solomon's prayer of dedication includes the petition that the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, should be richly blessed, so that, I'm quoting parts here, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people, Israel. It has been judged the most gloriously universalistic passage in the historical books. And Moses had also juxtaposed to his words about wisdom and understanding the hope that the nations would be awed at the prayer life of Israel. If God is exalted in Israel, the exaltation of Israel is the joy of the whole earth. When the refrain which characterizes Chronicles, his love endures forever, is taken up in Psalm 100, it is preceded, it is preceded by shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Monarchical and Sheban peaks had been long since foreseen from what one translation, this is the NFV again actually, calls rocky peaks by that most quixotic of extra Israelite characters, Balaam. From the rocky peaks I see them, from the heights I view them, I see people who live apart and do not consider themselves one of the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? A threat, perhaps, but for him who is in the know, a sign of blessing. Let me die the death of the righteous, may my end be like theirs. Such is the personal aspiration of a singular and isolated seer, speaking by divine inspiration. When in a prophecy which is even more dramatic, he beholds a star that will come out of Jacob, Balaam is still operating within, working within a framework of a distinction between Israel and the nations. 
but now he foresees enmity and not blessing. And so we have two sides of the coin. The elect has arrived on the scene of world history to be a blessing, but also a judgment upon the nations. However, the world is already under judgment, an assumption grounding Paul's argument from the outset of his letter to the Romans. So the story of election is the hopeful story of its undoing. Yet Israel too is judged as well as blessed. Under its sign, the same is true of the nations. The historical dialectic may be complex, but Israel and the nations are distinguished yet bound together. But if both Israel and the nations are subject to God's judgment and salvation within the scope of the cosmic purposes of God, why are not all the people of the earth elect? Amos' words provoke surprise in the reader. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Arameans from Kir? But why does the Old Testament tell a story which makes these words so superficially surprising? Why did God not very obviously deal impartially with all the peoples, establishing complete and unequivocal parity between Israel and the nations? Well, the outstanding reason for the election of one nation in the wider purposes of God is foreshadowed in the Old but manifested in the New Testament, the deliverance of the human race comes through the incarnate son of the Lord God himself, embodied in and inhabitant of space and time, and therefore of land and history. Genesis 49, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. But then he must be born of a woman a woman belonging to one of the peoples of the world, born into a culture, history, ancestry, inheritance. If God's supreme goal is neither the universal communication of information, nor indiscriminate theophany, but salvation through the particularity of incarnation, atonement, and resurrection, election can be termed a kind of necessity in order to attain this end. It is a common complaint that election excludes. Actually, it is the only it is the means and the only means of inclusion. There is no hope for the world if the Messiah does not grace it with his presence and no possibility of his coming into it without the prepared and particular connection of nation and of history. This is not in the least to play down what is so plain and central in the Old Testament, namely the calling of Israel to be holy and to demonstrate holiness. Demonstrate indeed the greatness of the Lord God himself. Already we read in relation to Abraham in Genesis, I have chosen him, says the Lord, apparently in communion with himself. The verb there is not actually the classic Baha uh, verb. It is, it is a different one. That, that verb, doesn't, the classic election one, doesn't come up until Deuteronomy, I think. I've chosen him, says the Lord, apparently in communion with himself, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Nothing is more important, as the government of the Messiah will show. But presumably, God can impart his law to many peoples, even bestow a vocation upon many peoples at one and the same time, so that the world should be populated with gnomic theodacts, people directly taught of God through his law. But what follows in Genesis picks out the uniqueness of what became Israel. Abraham is called so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. The promise can be worded in different ways, but at its center is the seed, Jesus Christ, as we see in New Testament's perspective. Jesus can only come out of one nation. Nothing seems religiously higher than theophany until theophany gives way to incarnation. The former, theophany, might be universally possible, but it does not save. The particularity of the latter, incarnation, will. Election, then, is a kind of necessity to the end of incarnation and reconciliation. But the language of necessity attaching to election has been applied more widely by that most influential of recent missiologists, Leslie Newbegin. And because he introduces us to some wider issues, I want to pause here with Newbegin. I was already bold enough in uh, setting aside a session to the Old Testament, when I'm not an Old Testament scholar, 
Um, I had not reckoned on Harold Letland being here when I mentioned Newbegin, so I will carry on boldly. Pekka uh, Fortiter. Harold may want to comment on this afterwards. We'll see. I want to pause here with Newbegin. George Hunsberger remarked that, and I quote him here, Newbegin's interpretation of the significance of election stands apart. Rarely, if ever, has anyone else given it the prominence which it has in his mission theology. And for no one else does it hold so foundational a place in the rationale for mission. Notwithstanding the possibility of exaggeration here, election undeniably had a high profile in Leslie Newbegin's work. As he put it in one of his main works, The Open Secret, the doctrine of election permeates and controls the whole Bible. So whence its necessity from Newbegin's standpoint? Well, he proposes it along three lines. Firstly, election is required for the anthropological reasons on account of, and I quote him, the nature and destiny of humanity. God wants to indicate human destiny in the form of anticipation and exemplification within the socio-historical nexus of interpersonal relationships. The elect, these are my words, the elect must show forth the secret of humanization and lead the way for the world. Secondly, election is required by the doctrine of God. God is personal and is known in personal relationship. He therefore acts in relation to human beings in their particular history, space, and time, so that they might respond to his personal activity. This also is revealed through the elect. Thirdly, the way of election is required by soteriology. Quote him again, salvation means wholeness, which must include the restoration of social justice and interpersonal relationships. The method of election means that I cannot be made whole apart from my neighbor on whom I have depended for the message of God's reign. The humility required to receive the message, this is still new begin, from another corresponds to the humility by which the grace of God must be received as a free gift. Now it's made me quite a lot to remember uh, just hearing it like that, but my question to, the, that is, to this is this. How does all this make election a matter of necessity? For God, God to fulfill his purposes on Newbegin's account, it may be necessary for him to act in history. It may even appear that election is an appropriate vehicle for the revelation of God and God's ways of election. We might regard election as a fitting vehicle. And if that word propels our minds in flight past the letter to the Hebrews all the way to Anselm in the Middle Ages, we shall know that the distinction between fittingness and necessity can get rather subtle. But the question remains, how do these particular stipulations which Newbegin advances establish the necessity of election rather than divine action in history. Surely they do not. But the reason that Newbegin presses them in that direction is instructive, I think. He repeatedly states in his work that election is not a privilege but a responsibility. Quote, God chooses men and women for the service of his mission. To be a Christian is to be part of a chosen company, chosen not for privilege, but for responsibility. Quote again, the people of Israel were bearers, not exclusive beneficiaries of a blessing to the nations. And again and again, it had to be said that election is for responsibility, not for privilege. And the church is just as Israel in that respect for new beginning. Quote him once again, we have to guard against the perversion which regards election as the conferring of a privileged status. Those quotations all come from the open secret, but the same note is struck in, for example, the Gospel of the Pluralist Society, more recent work, though a little old now. Quote, I, quote, I do quote him from this. As the story unfolds in scripture, it becomes clear that to be God's chosen people means not privilege, but suffering, reproach, humiliation. What New Begin aims to do here is to close the gap opened up by a putatively unhealthy doctrine of election, a gap between Israel and the nations, or between the church and extra ecclesial communities, whereby the elected and rejected, or the elected and unelected, stand in contrast. And to stave off this misrepresentation, New Begin accents the need for an historical demonstration of religious and social relationships in the life of a nation. 
and biblical election is assimilated to that need. Now, Leslie Newbegin believed in and robustly defended the particular Christological reason for election too, incarnation and reconciliation. Nevertheless, when he goes beyond this in the way that I've indicated, the phrase responsibility, not privilege, surely rings strange in our ears. If we suspect that lack of scholarship fosters the habit of not making distinctions, that may be an elitist suspicion, but if we suspect that. We may also suspect that the presence of scholarship runs the risk of making artificial ones. True, privilege can be mishandled in thought and action. It is right to expose unworthy sentiments in connection with what reason called an infatuation of the privilege. As Spinoza said in the 17th century, opening his treatment of the vocation and election of the Hebrews in the Tractatus Theologico Politicus. Every man's true happiness and blessedness consists solely in the enjoyment of what is good, not in the pride that he alone is enjoying it to the exclusion of others. But why, in Newbegin's analysis, confine the word privilege to the debased sense of the word? Now, it may be one thing to say that Israel is not chosen for privilege. I'm not acceding to that uh, one way or the other. Uh, that is, I'm not affirming or denying that way of putting it. But it's another to say that the choice itself is not a privilege, which also comes through in what he's saying. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. We read in one of the great election manifestos of Scripture, Deuteronomy. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession, Deuteronomy again. And later, the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor, high above all nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord God, as he promised. At least as one translation has it. And I'll be indicating an alternative translation there a little later. Do we not lose something of importance if we allow the bad coin of false pride to drive out the precious gold of privilege? I am, by the way, concentrating here on Newbegin's formulations, not what the man himself might say when pressed. Independent thinker as he was, Newbegin was falling in here with a wider trend. His position resonates with that taken in the mid-century study of election by H.H. H. Rowley. Although Rowley and Newbegin understood the relation of election to mission in significantly different ways. Rowley's election for service seems to have been something of a slogan for powerful missiological trends in the second half of the 20th century. Though Rowley himself was swift to add that, quote, this is not to ignore that it carries with it privilege. Election is most certainly election for service, and I take it to be at the heart of the Old Testament understanding of election. But the desire to remove the perceived scandal of the doctrine of election, generated by its misuse, has led to the kind of overreaction which is so pervasive in intellectual history. Reactive thinking creates false antitheses. And it sometimes seems as though we, possibly for we, read males in the dominant Western intellectual tradition, possible that we are constitutionally enslaved by it the habit of false antithesis reaction. Leibniz, behind his unassuming verbiage, Leibniz was surely making a solid point when he said very simply, most philosophical schools are largely right in what they assert, not so much in what they deny. And out of the corner of my eye, I have just seen Simeon nod and remind us that this is what went wrong with Calvinists and Arminians. They are, he said, all right in all they affirm and wrong in all they deny. I wasn't meant to, to refer to a Simeon yesterday, but somebody else did from, uh, from the floor. And today, was it you? Someone referred to him in a seminar earlier to do today. So I'm reclaiming Simeon with this uh, quotation of his. But away from Simeon. For those of you who weren't here in the first session, I made much of Simeon, and I'll be making more of him in the fifth session, Monday afternoon. But away from Simeon, what is the perceived scandal in the doctrine of election? It is the scandal of exclusivism, Wrongly interpreted, exclusivism fost election fosters a blinkered outlook focused solely on imminent historical destiny in the case of Israel or the transcendent eschatological destiny in the case of the church. 
of the privileged community. True enough, there is no need to dispute that corporate election to the service uh, of ministry to the nations is at the heart of Old Testament election. Chris Wright has recently compellingly defended a social mandate in connection with election, which he treats in the context of mission. That's in that big book of his, The Mission of God. But we dare not eclipse a privilege which is more than the privilege of a particular historical vocation. And Chris Wright himself doesn't eclipse it, though in my final lecture I'm going to indicate a misgiving about his undoubtedly very impressive work. We might agree that the eschatological post-mortem fate of individuals within Israel is not directly in view when election is directly in view even when we want outside the preferred term, Bahar, which particularly focuses the theme of election. We cannot correlate election as it applies to any particular group in the Old Testament with the post-mortem fate of individuals in that group. If that's what's being reacted against, all right, as far as it goes. But reference to groups reminds us of different forms or levels of election that existed within Israel. And it is when we tend to these that we discover a vast territory marked privilege which lies between the areas marked service to others and the destiny of the few. This area, the one I want to demarcate, uh, have demarcated, the one I want to describe a bit, is more fully designated communion with the living God. At all levels of election, whatever its instrumental necessity in God's hands for carrying out particular historical purposes, it carries with it the peculiar privileges of the elect, privilege of communion. And if the Lord is our life, Deuteronomy 30, 20, there is no higher privilege. And if he's the God of the living, it is also an eschatological privilege. When we consider the election within election that took place in Israel, two tribes are outstanding, Judah and Levi. The pre-Davidic history of Judah is full of interest at the dedication of the tabernacle in the desert. The one who brought his offering on the first day was Nashon, son of Abinadab of the tribe of Judah. When shortly afterwards the people of Israel resumes its march after being on pause since the book of Exodus, it is Judah and Nashon that lead the way. The tribe first named in the book of Numbers to help Eleazar and Joshua in land distribution is Judah. And in the book of Joshua itself, after the case of the Transjordanians is sorted out, it is the allotment to Judah that heads up the list and dominates it. In the dreadful civil conflict that saw the isolation of the Benjaminites, God commands that Judah must go first to fight them. All this before the book of Ruth discloses to us her relationship with David after her marriage with Nation's grandson, Boaz. The first tribe listed in Revelation 7, you'll notice, by the way, from which 12,000 are sealed, is Judah comes first. Now, admittedly, various expressions of the piety of tribal members may account for some of this privilege. Caleb was its stalwart exemplar in his day. But the divinely independent sovereignty of choice is also involved, culminating in David himself. And David could only be amazed at his election. I quote, the Lord God of Israel chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the house of Judah he chose my family, and from my father's sons he was pleased to make me king over Israel. Personal and national privilege alike fill him with equal awe. Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this, a gift for the building of the temple? The Psalms testify to David's communion with God. Yes, indeed, it was necessary for Israel to have on its throne the type of one who was to come. And presumably necessary to have an inspiring psalmist, too, although he wasn't alone, of course. But David receives far more than the privilege of responsibility. Election is about the depth of personal communion possible for its humble recipient. The high privilege of David's election is something in which Israel must rejoice. The high privilege of Israel's election is something which the nations must rejoice. The high privilege of David's election is something which the nations must rejoice. But election is not just a means to an end. It is peerless privilege for the elect. Perhaps we could speak of a kind of necessity attached to the election of Levi too. 
proper order in a tribal society, his only kept of responsibilities are tribally allocated. Someone had to perform the duties surrounding priesthood, one clan, the ironic, possessing religiously distinctive responsibilities. The Levite principle is immense. Sorry, privilege is immense. When I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set them apart from myself, and I've taken the Levites in place of all the firstborn sons of Israel, says the Lord in the book of Numbers, which has heavily underlined the position of the Levites from its beginning. With privilege comes responsibility and accountability. Nadab and Abihu are punished with great severity. And the tribe of Levi can be the source of the worst. Not only did Aaron lead the people in the transgression of the golden calf, but Korah's rebellion was essentially a Levite rising, although Reubenites were also implicated in it. But the Levites are spared the privilege of land in Canaan because they have the greater privilege of the Lord as their inheritance. I am aware, by the way, though not competent to adjudicate, I am aware of the many critical issues that surround many of these questions. I, I hope I'm not as naive as this may sound. Uh, I'm following the narrative. I have reason for doing that. They have spared the privilege of land in Canaan because they have the greater privilege of the Lord as their inheritance. This is implemented in Joshua, which contains a remarkable reference to Joshua's own humble retirement in the land, having been given by his fellow Israelites an allocation of land in Timnath Sirah, even before Joshua is named as the one who divided up the land. Eleazar the priest is named. Samuel was a Levite, at least on the account in First Chronicles, and two of the three major prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, were priests. The latter concludes his prophecy with the description of the allocation of land divided amongst all the tribes, but with a special portion to be offered to the Lord, and this is the sacred portion for the priests. That's the final chapter, 48. The central portion of this special portion is the sanctuary of the Lord himself and reserved for the faithful Zadokites. The other Levites still have the best of the remaining land, which is especially holy to the Lord. Now, although specific faithfulness is rewarded here in the case of the Zadokites, it remains that purely tribal membership of Levi is a special privilege. Members have been put in the position of being able to exhibit a peculiar kind of faithfulness. Where you are in the land and what you do in the temple signifies a spiritual communion, privilege and responsibility. Whatever forms of necessity attach to the socio-religious organization of Israel, the reality of communion is a privilege of grace. Ezekiel's geography is deeply interesting. Comparison with the geographical descriptions of tribal allocations of land in Numbers 34 and in the book of Joshua, reveals that borders have drastically shifted around in at the end of Ezekiel, as though to provide an idealized description. Issachar and Zebulun come uh, south of Judah's north of Benjamin. This is a sign, incidentally, that we have to be careful in interpreting his prophecy as though Ezekiel himself expected his literal fulfillment, or to be more accurate, fulfillment in the literal form given in his prophecy. The territorial redefinitions appear to be evidence of a hierarchical principle in the prophetic mind. And the privilege of communion with God granted in sheer sovereign choice is assumed. I would be very, very grateful for those of you who are Old Testament scholars to put me right if I'm making egregious errors here. Please do publicly. That will only be helpful for all of us. What higher privilege is possible than for a person to know his or her Lord, the Lord God of Israel? Let me see your glory, said Moses, stirred by a spiritual impulse which surely goes far beyond a passion to serve. I was privileged to hear Graham, uh, Graham Cole in, uh, he's a friend of old, that's why I dare call him by the Christian name. Perhaps it's not proper in this context, sorry if not. But I was privileged to hear him this morning in chapel and he referred to Tertullian. And in Tertullian's uh, Latin translation which he was using, um, he talks about um, Moses seeing the posterior of God, the hind quarters of God. And he plays in the double entendre there. Moses will see God in temporibus posterioribus, in posterior times, or in later times. That is, at the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah. He sees God posteriorly. It's charming and fanciful. Um, <laughs> but certainly, to show you on to this, communion with God will turn out to have no terminus in the grave. If election means the 
possibility of communion, it is neither limited to service and time, nor limited to time itself. The reward of a good man, said Kierkegaard, is to be able to worship God in truth. It is certainly the case in the Old Testament that it is the pure in heart who will see God. To the pure, you show yourself pure to risk taking rather hasty liberties in the English language with David's words. Kierkegaard's words are found in his book, Purity of Heart, is to will one thing. So I'm not assuming the automatic trans transposition of earthly Levite communion with God, for example, into the unending eschaton. My point is that election placed people in a position of opportunity, the opportunity of communion. And communion with God does not end with the grave. In the service of God is man's supreme privilege and honor, Rowley remarked. Perhaps it is a needless cavil to express the worry that this statement, with all the rich and important truth that it contains, privileges the able-bodied and able-minded adult. My worry is more justified when we note that Rowley at least ran the risk of playing down the distinction between the election of Israel for its role as the bearer of revelation and the election of other nations, God's choosing of, to quote Rowley, Greece, to achieve cultural heights far beyond Israel's. Now, a theological world away from Rowley, and even further in the past, Abraham Kuyper, in a lecture on Calvinism and art, stated that Quote, if Israel was chosen for the sake of religion, this in no way prevented a parallel election of the Greeks for the domain of philosophy and for the revelations of art, nor of the Romans for the classical development within the domain of law and state. Kuiper may not have been well advised to put it like this, but at least it is a parallel modified by his steady distinction between common and saving grace. Anyway, if we presume to use the language of election to cover Greece as well as Israel, the first thing that we must do is to distinguish, not associate the senses. Not distinguishing merely the spheres, religion and philosophy, for example, but distinguishing the very meanings of election. We should scarcely need to justify this by appealing to the semantic field surrounding Israel's historical experience of election, a field that includes language of purchase, redemption, knowing, peculiar, in other words, to election as it applies to Israel. I hope it is clear that I've not been flailing around red herrings, profitlessly plundering even the thinkers of another day to make my point. It is right that election is responsibility and election for service in the Old Testament, and for that matter, the new, though we come to that in the next session, should be emphasized when the alternative is to narrow the biblical vision opened out by its account of election. But we do not aid the flow of responsibility by draining out of it the incomparable privilege of communion with the living God. And it's surprising to me how often this seems to happen at the level of theological declaration. I'm obviously not presuming to say anything whatsoever about the personal piety of various authors. Please, please hear me clearly on that. It is indeed a privilege capable of fostering not only irresponsibility, but also pride in the elect. Of reason, supported here by the likes of Preuss, wrote that, quote, the truth of Israel's election is an untruth if it is rationally understood to mean that for that reason, that is for the reason of Israel's election, God has rejected the nations of the world. And for that reason, Israel is of more importance to God than those other nations. For Israel was only elected in order to serve God in the task of leading those other nations to God. Note that final phrase. Israel was only elected in order to serve God in the task of leading those other nations to God. What is said before that is true to a large extent, but I question that clause. At risk of over-egging the New Begin theme, and indeed uh, sustaining too polemical a note in this lecture, I was too late revising lecture, before I realized it sounded as if I was just going, off, going at people negatively. I hope I have not conveyed that impression too strongly. 
But the risk of sustaining too polemical note, uh, I'll return to Hans Berger in his account of Newbegin. Quote, this hunger for missionary humility and the rejection of everything which perpetuates human egoism leads to Newbegin's persistent assertion that election is not for special privilege, but for special responsibility. Leslie Newbegin personally exemplified deepest humility, from which I, for one, can only learn. And any balanced assessment of his missiological contribution, which I am scarcely competent to offer, would have to integrate those things to which I have drawn attention into a host of other worthy emphases in his work. But all things considered, are we not in danger of gauging in dubious commercial practice? For we do not help religious trade if we risk exchanging a sense of the privilege of special communion for a sense of the breadth of God's universal concerns. Each is too precious to be commodified in theological barter. God's commerce with his people promises to take a truly extraordinary turn when Isaiah foretells a highway from Egypt to Assyria. In the day that it has traveled, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Extraordinary, yes. Yet to Israel alone, God says, in the same prophet uh, later, I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Sheba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight. And because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you. Readers of the narrative who follow the order of books in the Hebrew Bible will want to hear from no one more than from Isaiah by the time of the turn to the prophets. For only two of the writing prophets are mentioned there before we get to them. Unless Zephaniah the priest in two kings is to be identified with Zephaniah the prophet, and I have no idea how likely that is. One name mentioned is Jonah, mentioned briefly in Second Kings. The other is Isaiah who has by far the higher profile. Sennacherib the Assyrian, this is in the historical books, of course, Sennacherib the Assyrian threatens Israel under Hezekiah, and Hezekiah is in despair, though this is repeated in Isaiah's prophecy. Then Isaiah enters and speaks to him of God Almighty in this situation. Not only is his might available in defense of Jerusalem, but Sennacherib is only where he is because God himself has ordained it. It is not just the threat to Israel that brings Isaiah onto the scene, it is the pride of the one who threatens it. Sennacherib, what Isaiah announces in the nar narrative marks his prophecy. God's ordination of human affairs is the antidote to human pride. Isaiah, along with the psalmist, is, is he not, the great teacher of humility in Israel. The references to pride are striking in that later 7th century, early 6th century period of prophecy. Um, Obadiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, even Nahum implicitly, I think. But the prophecy of Isaiah, of course, covers a vast era. And along with Deuteronomy and the Psalmist, he's also the great teacher of election in Israel. Interestingly, these are also the books, though not the only books, in which a positive prospect for the nations come into view. Although in the case of Deuteronomy, perhaps we should say a positive view of the nations rather than positive prospect for. I, I will leave you who are expert in these things to sort that one out. In Isaiah's prophecy, the question of Israel's election is elevated into a transcendent context. It is set in a sphere of incredible breadth as well as height. God has his eye on the nations. But the more the prophetic eye is trained on breadth, the more certainly it is drawn thence upwards to height. When God's direction of human history is seen to emerge from his peerless counsel. And as Sennacherib must learn humility, so Isaiah accents it as the need of the day for the people of Israel. Righteousness, justice, the holiness of obedience, yes, of course, who more than Isaiah exalts these? But when the nation has stumbled into mortal danger, what exactly do righteous ways avail? It may all be too little too late. Even the virtue of a Hezekiah, even the faithfulness of a Josiah, we find in the historical books, will not stop the slide. Now is a time of crisis, as never before we must look to God to dispose of things as he wills. And so faith is expressed not just in righteous ethical conduct, but in spiritual peace, quietness, and trust. The tranquility of humble faith is the need of the hour in the hour of crisis. 
26th chapter of Isaiah, not long before he arrives at one of the Potter passages, prominent in Paul's letter to the Romans, he epitomizes much in Isaiah's prophecy to that point. I'll stick the NIV here. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. So God has effectively told Ahaz earlier through the prophet. So he will effectively tell Hezekiah through the same prophets. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And so at a time of crisis, those who will listen, that remnant whom God preserves, will learn not only that God has plans for the nations, but will learn also what spiritual effect upon the individual an awareness of God's sovereign election is meant to have. This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word, Isaiah 66, 2. Isaiah is the book of grand unities, creation and redemption, salvation and judgment, God's glory and Israel's deliverance, the election of Israel and the blessing of the nations, right worship and social justice. It is also the book which tells us that the proper form of our missionary humility before others is to be shaped by the proper form of our personal humility before God. And the very opportunity of the latter is a unique privilege. And however we define it, Israel has a mission. The story of Israel's election is a story of hope to the nations in a world under judgment. Israel is called to be holy, for holiness is what the Lord wants. And in showing holiness forth to the nations, Israel does them the greatest service. Israel's mission is to make the name of the Lord great upon the earth, and the psalmist celebrates it, longing for the nations to rejoice. The psalms themselves are, in the Hebrew, praises. No unhealthy exclusiveness here. But no comprehensive egalitarianism either. And this we will accept if we simply in our hearts let the Lord, who has no counselors, have his way. There is a supplementary note, and with this I'm winding up which needs to be heard along with all the others, and we need to listen to it rather carefully in our conclusion. I am going to be tentative here, uh, and would welcome any remarks uh, well-informed folk have on this. What is the supplementary note? Well, Israel's role in regard to the nations is sometimes described as mediatorial, priestly role, although this is controverted. We've already seen the priesthood as a privilege in itself, but there is more for Israel. I quote from Deuteronomy, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands that I give you today, says Moses, drawing to his conclusion, his farewell speech, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Let's hear again words that I quoted earlier. This is the NIV. He has declared that he will set you, Israel, in praise, fame, and honor, high above the nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 15, by the way, says you will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. Now, that earlier verse can be alternatively translated like this. He will set you high above all the nations he has made for praise and for a name and for honor. That is for himself. He made the nations of praise and honor for himself, not Israel high above the nations for its praise and honor. But even here, of course, Israel is exalted. I am not convinced myself that we should play down this theme, if I may say that as an amateur. According to Isaiah 61.6, Israel's people will be called eschatologically priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Chris Wright remarked that, quote, though there is a rhetoric of submission to Israel, this is probably no more than a figuration of the recognition that is Israel's God who reigns supreme. The rhetorical form in which the supremacy of Israel's God is stated, therefore, is that Israel should be exalted. See, is that right? Is it just a rhetorical form? I wonder if this is to play down a privilege. In order to play up what, of course, cannot be played up too high, soli deo gloria. But E.J. Young was surely right to emphasize, emphasize Zion's obtaining the glory of the Gentiles, the wealth and possessions. The nations have the greatest privilege. They will see, learn, worship, even in respect, become as Israel itself. But does this mean that the peculiarly elect, na elect nation will not reign? There are discriminations within the elect, as we have seen. Why not also between the protologically elect and eschatologically elect people? 
when the Lord will have compassion on Jacob, says Isaiah, before his dramatic announcement of God's designs for Egypt and Assyria, he will once again choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. And the house of Israel will possess the nations as men servants and maid servants in the Lord's land. What does it mean? Well, it is, of course, an important indication of how election works. God renews his electing work as a temporal activity. But it also is of a piece with what we learn throughout the Old Testament. If ever Israel is regarded as inter pares, it is most certainly primum inter pares. Israel is the firstborn son, the first fruits of the Lord's harvest. We too easily forget the temporal primacy of the ancient world is not simply that, as though there is no preeminence attached. Final paragraph, brief one. We dare not anticipate out of the Old Testament what the New Testament will bring. All seems precarious as we draw to a close with Ezra or Malachi. But we have hope. It is a hope embedded in thanksgiving. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord, Psalm 107, 43. We do, however, dare to feel at the conclusion of the Old Testament that if election in the New Testament will deserve anything less than praise in Israel and amongst the nations, we shall have lost or missed something. Throughout the Old Testament, says Mart, this riddle of Israel, and therefore of men, is a hard, but also a hopeful eschatological riddle, a riddle which points beyond itself. And perhaps the form in which the hope of Israel and the nations is fulfilled in the New Testament is where the riddle election really sets in. Well, thank you. Uh, well, this has changed my thinking about one matter, uh, surely. I'll, I'll never think about an off posteriori proof in the same way again. So thank you for that. Um, let me ask a question that perhaps gets at the transition between this week and next week, the move from Old Testament to New Testament. Um, I'm trying to get a fix on the concept or concepts of election. And I think I heard you say today that there's a kind of corporate election that is more than to responsibility, but less than salvific. And if that is the case, is it, is it typological of something? Is there a kind of communion with God that's non-salvific? Is that the type, or are we to expect in the New Testament a counterpart in between stage? I'm just trying to get a fix on this uh, third position between the corporate responsible mm, okay. and individual uh, salvific. Yes. Thank you. Um, that last clause of yours, the last two words, is significant, individual salvific, because what I was going to say up to that point was this, that if I'd given the impression that it was either corporate election to service or salvation, then I gave a misimpression. The contrast in my mind was between corporate election to service and election to an eschatological post-mortem destiny, salvation in that individualistic okay. sense. Uh, so that was the contrast I had in mind. I wasn't denying salvation. I, I didn't bring that up as a theme, which perhaps I should have. But I suppose, Kevin, what I have in mind is two things. I have in mind both the common perception in churches and in Christianity about the nature of election that has all to do with predestination to eternal life. And I have in mind also the way in which uh, very often Old Testament scholars and systematic theologians seem to be talking a different language when they talk about election. And it's not election in the Old Testament sense that is in the mind of many people uh, when they hear election out there in the churches. Mm -hmm. It is individual salvation. Mm -hmm post-mortem salvation. Now, I will try to say something about that, obviously, when I come to the New Testament next Monday, but, but I did not mean that they weren't elect to salvation in some sense. Uh, I simply meant that the language of election in the Old Testament, uh, not just strictly at the big word election, but more widely, doesn't pick out the eschatological salvation of particular individuals, not, not anyway uh, as, a, as a group, uh, Levites or kings or 
the nation itself. Does that? Uh, it does, but I heard apply? you also saying that instead of simply corporate responsibility, you underlined corporate privilege. I did, and it sounds like corporate communion. And so I was. That's what I was uh, interested yes. in. Yes. What this status of communion that's less than the eschatological communion, but still real. Yeah, I'm trying to do two things there too. Thanks for uh, following it up. I'm trying to do two things there too. I'm trying to um, to get away from the supposition that it's either election to earthly service or election to eschatological postmortem destiny. And the area I want to carve out is its election to the privilege of communion with a living God. Now, uh, the reason I put it like that is that the word privilege is precisely was downplayed mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. texts. Mm -hmm. So I want to say privilege, privilege, privilege here. Uh, admittedly, then, I am opening a back door to uh, eschatological post-mortem salvation, too. Uh, but that comes most clearly to light in the New Testament. Of course, I'm not saying there's no reference to uh, life after death in the old, but in its correlation um, to the lives of the great um, leaders in Israel, or the great saints in Israel. In his correlation, that only comes to light in the New Testament, where Jesus, of course, memorably says, he's God of, of the living, not of the dead. And therefore, you know, all, all the fathers will be there at the banqueting table. Thank you. Does that clarify? It does. So if you have questions, please move to the microphones. You have to move. You're distancing yourself from me now with this question. <laughs> First of all, thank you for such a rich um, exposition of uh, scripture and particularly the Old Testament and particularly the book of Isaiah. Um, I'm still processing a number of the themes that you brought out and how they relate to one another. I do have a question. I admit I feel a little, um, I feel a little tension with uh, some of your conclusions. Um, I um, particularly, I, um, I'm thinking about Isaiah, you pointed out the preeminence of, of uh, Israel and, and its uh, role of, as being the um, historically appointed uh, um, mediating community out of which uh, the Messiah would come. I'm just thinking about Isaiah and um, John's appropriation of Isaiah in the book of Revelation. And I'm thinking about the, the final vision in chapters uh, 21 and 22, where it seems to me that, um, and forgive me, I haven't sorted this out, and I'm not a biblical theologian. Um, that's not my specialization. But um, one, of the, one of the tensions I, uh, that I perceive, and I'm, I'm not sure yet what to do with, is just simply the fact that um, in, in the Old Testament, and particularly in Isaiah, we have these themes of um, God's grace, obviously, um, encompassing the nations. But there is this theme of uh, the nations being subservient to Israel, in, even in Isaiah 60. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about how does that correlate with the vision in John, in the, in the um, Yohanan vision of Revelation 21 and 22, where we have the nations, the kings, entering the heavenly city, bringing their gifts um, in tribute. But um, again, I don't see the preeminence of Israel okay. um, being upheld there. So I'm wondering how, how you read um, the book of Isaiah and the Old Testament the theme of election um, Christologically in terms of new, the New Testament uh, theology canonically. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, thanks very much. I certainly would uh, value hearing from Old Testament scholars, uh, any of you who are here on this, because I do know there are different views taken amongst you or amongst them. Is there another? Are you going to follow this up? Or? All right, you, you can let me through. Okay. The threatening figure of Graham Cole since. <laughs> <laughs> I first met him when he asked me some very awkward questions in a paper in Cambridge many years ago, and he hasn't changed, I fear, so I'll take a long time to answer this question. I anyway, go on at length. Um, um, I, I, think that, um, I think that, you know, I'd like to hear from Old Testament scholars on this, but it seems to me in the book of Revelation, which, as you say, makes use of Isaiah, it seems to me that even if you interpret it in the strongest, most positive sense in relation to the nations, 
the kings of nations will bring their glory in. Uh, even if you interpret it as some like Richard Bockham does, in strong terms as a conversion of the nations, dispute with Gregory Beale, of course, over that and others involved. Even then, what we are not told is that the nations will reign. But we are told in the first three chapters of Revelation about those who are faithful to Christ, that they will reign, and the martyrs, and the, the foundations and gates of the holy city have inscribed in them the name of the, of the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes, but not of the nations. So it seems to me that even, uh, and I really would like correction on this for those of you who think I'm just wrong here, that, and I was going to say this actually a little bit uh, on Monday, uh, even a high view of the nations there does not, it seems to me, um, entail the highest. I don't see that the nations reign. Now, I am aware, of course, of all the difficulties of interpreting the book of Revelation. And I would I'd like to say that, uh, that the way things will end up in human history, uh, we don't know. The riddle of resolution is eschatologically there in Revelation, but we can't decode it perfectly and not meant to. So that would be my response, I think. I don't know if, if you want to come back with me or whether we should let Dr. Cole say Go something. Ahead, okay. yeah. yeah. Thank you. I found this extremely stimulating, as I would expect from you, uh, Stephen, so thank yeah. you so much. I was just wondering, as a, just a comment on uh, Kevin's query. I wonder if King Saul is an example who, be, who experienced the privilege yeah. but then bombed on the vocation. Yes. Uh, but a kind of communicative election, at least for a while. Um, but I just want your uh, comment, Stephen, if I may, on this notion of privilege, which is the thing that I think I'll be taking away uh, today uh, from this lecture. I wonder Paul's comment in, or Paul's uh, statement in Romans 9.4 where he talks about the privileges of Israel. Uh, he doesn't mention election, but he mentions adoption. Yeah. And I wonder if the notion of adoption, analytically, we have election and privilege. And I just wonder if you're going to uh, have some treatment of that when you get onto the New Testament, or is that something you've thought about? Uh, Romans 9, 4 then. Yes, um, thank you. In fact, originally, on that card which circulated, I think there's a whole lecture supposed to be in Romans 9 to 11, but that's not gonna happen, by the way. Um, <laughs> Yes, that's something maybe I should have highlighted, uh, Graham, actually. The, the adoptive sonship privilege. Of course, strong statements, extraordinarily strong statements are made in the Old Testament about what will become of the other nations, too, that God will even take them under his wings, and they will call on him as the Lord their God. They will come to the temple and be able to worship, subject to all the favors, Zechariah 14, and that extraordinary passage in Isaiah, where it seems that... Egypt and Assyria, too, are, are embraced by the Lord. But nevertheless, yes, I, I, I agree with you, and that's maybe something I should have made more of, that uh, the privilege of adopted sonship, yes, would be a, a component. One thing that interests me in Romans 9.4, by the way, slightly tangential, is that uh, Paul, with all the privileges he lists, doesn't talk about the land. I don't know why. Some will say that's because he expects them to return the land in Romans 11. Maybe it's implied in the temple. But uh, yes, thank you for that. Maybe being in Christ is the new land. I certainly interpret it that way. I think the in, the un, in location becomes rather than geographically in the land in Christ, I do. But it's nevertheless an interesting omission. And I know that some people make much of it. No, thank you. That's, uh, that's helpful. Oh, sorry, Tom. You asked me again. about essentialism and actualism all over again, aren't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, my question has to do um, with, well, I actually have a couple, but I'll give you an either or as to what you want to answer. One has to do with we, um, the issue of what do we do with the familial language that's used? I hear, I've heard, seem to have heard more of judicial or kingly kind of language, who reigns? But think, thinking back, for instance, you alluded to Exodus, I think it was Exodus 4.22, uh, Israel being the firstborn son, we have four children and just welcomed uh, a nephew of five into the world. Firstborn seems to imply um, or at least suggest more children. 
And yeah. when we come, say, to Isaiah 19, we have this vision. Uh, it's not familial language exactly, but a vision of the nations is Assyria and Egypt with Israel standing shoulder to shoulder. Yes. And so I'm wondering if how the, seems, seem, what seems to me familial language, which runs throughout the Old Testament as well, this imagery of the nations together as children, yeah. um, how that factors in as well. Does one child um, reign over the others or, or what? I, it's not that they're mutually exclusive, of course, but I'm wondering how it fits in. The second thing I'm wondering is with respect to Romans 2, where Paul considers this question, well, what Romans 2 and 3, what advantage then is there to being a Jew? And they've been entrusted with the very words of God. It seems to me that from that passage, one might take the suggestion that the privilege and responsibility actually really come together. Yes. In other words, the part of the privilege is the responsibility. You've been given this privilege, what advantage is being entrusted, which is a responsibility. So um, I'd like to hear your responses to those. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll respond to the second one first, if I may. Um, I agree with you. The only reason I appeared to be contrasting um, privilege and responsibility and playing off one against the other is that that's what's being done in the literature, I find. So I was trying to redress that. I, I entirely agree with you on, on Romans there. In relation to your first uh, uh, question or observation, I'd, I'd say two things. The first is that, in a way, I was invite, inviting trouble in trying to do a lecture in the Old Testament in one session. I should have maybe said at the very beginning that I was not going to attempt to be comprehensive here. And uh, I don't have the competence to, to be anyway. Uh, so really, I was, uh, there is a certain spin, as it were, uh, on, the, on the discussion. Secondly, I didn't mean to emphasize rain as much as you suggested. I said it was a supplementary note that needed to be heard. And perhaps I should have made clear, the implication I think is, yes, if Israel is the firstborn son, that there are other sons abroad and out there. I'm not sure if that's the way to read it, but that seems to me to be the implication. So thanks for bringing that to attention. Yes, I would not want to play up rain against filial status. Now, I'm grateful for that. Uh, those two observations correct a bit the picture I was giving. I wasn't trying really to give a you know, comprehensive picture. I wasn't talking about temple very much at all, which is crucial, or, or David. Um, may, I, may I, with your permission, Kevin, it's hard for you to withhold it when I'm going on one sentence like this or asking one question. Um, may I ask if there are Old Testament scholars here who want to make observations on this, particularly of a critical or corrective nature or supplementary nature? <laughs> that, that shows what he thought. He left and discussed. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Lewis. Um, stepping back uh, more broadly, uh, theologically, um, the, the idea of election. Do you see any implications on how perhaps to apply uh, what you are bringing out to an understanding of the angels that are elect? Of the angels? Yeah. Uh, Timothy, isn't it? The elect, yes. the presence of the elect angels. Right. Uh, no, I don't see any implications <laughs> from the Old Testament, from what I've said today. It's uh, a striking text, not least by virtue of its unusualness. Now, I know that what may strike us as unusual would not have struck other readers necessarily. So what I should, I should qualify that by saying it's striking text because it's not typically uh, the language talked from election is talked about. Uh, but I don't, I don't see any implications from what I've said for angelology, except this perhaps, that, and this has been the case, I've, I've read this and what I've read on election in the Old Testament, that, that the reference to angels is taken to confirm the importance of election to service. Because whatever else some people say is involved, elect angels aren't elect to eternal salvation. They're already there with the Lord. I mean, I don't remember, 
this is skating a terribly thin ice. I don't remember any text in the Old Testament. Um, that applies, that talks about angels, unless there's something Daniel, Zechariah, that applies the language of election to them. But am I, am I wrong there? Perhaps there is, perhaps there are elect angels in the old. No, so the short answer is, but I can't give short answers. I'm Welsh and I ramble on. The short answer is no, I don't see the implications other than perhaps confirmation for some people that election to service is what is central in scripture. Thank you very much uh, for this talk. It's been very sort of instructive and uh, thought provoking. I don't want to push you to uh, the question of application too quickly, but do you see any applications in your um, <laughs> having, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to do it anyway, uh, applications in your wanting to uh, emphasize privilege and preeminence, particularly for Israel? My inclination certainly is to believe that Paul is holding forth for Israel as some sort of community or people. Now, of course, try to work out what present Israel is in relation to ancient Israel as a task in itself, but some sort of identifiable, identifiably Jewish presence that he's holding out some hope from. That's what I think he's doing, but I'm not sure. But um, I do not derive from that any conclusions about, let's say, the land of Israel. I don't conclude from that that because Paul expects, it seems to me, some kind of historically significant return of Jews to their Messiah, that because of that, um, he is therefore uh, giving sanction to those who say the land of Israel now belongs to the people of Israel, and, and, that, and that the, it might for other reasons belong to the people of Israel, but not out of Paul, and that this is gonna be the scene of his eschatological deliverance. It may well be that he leaves open the possibility of the physical turf of Israel being a place of tremendous deliverance in the future. He may leave open that possibility, but I do not think anything in Romans 11 actually says that. Is that responding properly to your question, or have I missed something? Um, yes, I guess I'm, I, I was, I was, I guess I was just surprised by your emphasis on privilege, and so I was just trying to feel out what that would look like uh, if, we were, if we were to emphasize that practically in, in, in our application of our life in the church, our life here and now. I was just trying to get at why you, why you chose that. Well, but it is an undeniable privilege, is not to be a people of the Lord's possession, the elect people. Can one deny that that is privilege? Responsibility is brought with it. I don't see how that can be denied. Uh, either when we relate it to the old, as I have done, or refer it to the new. And then what, what does it entail on that? Well, it entails a huge responsibility. Very often for us, election is a sign of security. For some people, of course, insecurity, because they ask for their member of the elect, but election is meant to be a sign of security. In one respect, it's in the New Testament, that is, it's a pledge of God's goodness towards us in electing Gentiles as well as Jews. But it's, it's also a place of greatest danger in its way. Uh, hence warnings, even to the elect Gentiles who come in, Romans 11, they are warned they could be cut off, they could go the same route as Israel. So the, attached in scripture to privilege is huge responsibility, which can, which can crush you, were it not for the thought that grace is at the heart of all this. Is, is that doing a bit better at meeting uh, the question? Thanks. I think with that, we'll draw this third session to a close. Uh, I began by mentioning what else is happening today, this conference with Moltmann, and I it's apparently a tradition at these conversations that when they have a guest, they play a lightning round quiz game with the guest, and they put names of theologians out there, and the guest is supposed to give a one-sentence response. And so <laughs> Moltmann, Moltmann was, names were thrown at him, and he tried. Uh, Wolfhart Pannenberg a dear friend and opponent. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer died too young. Alfred North Whitehead, difficult to read. <laughs> and then my personal favorite, Pelagius, patron saint of American Christians. <laughs>
I'm going to put myself in the chair just for a moment, say Stephen Williams, and I'll respond, fresh breath of Welsh systematic air. <laughs> Thanks again. We'll look forward to hearing you on Monday.